Hello. Good evening. Go ahead and make some adjustments. All right, we are live. Ooh, we are live. I feel like the lighting is different. Hello. As always, we got the uh, live stream started just a little bit early, and we'll be starting in about eight minutes. <laughs> Gwen Pasby says, ready, set, go. Oh, hold on. We're going to let everyone else get here first. But it's good to see you, Gwen. got a little bit erased so I want to make sure it's still legible I really should redo the whole thing because I put Abraham and Moses in lowercase and then all the rest of them all in uppercase which is but that's kind of how I do things so that's okay we'll uh, we'll get started in oh about seven minutes or so make sure I have everything this week Pam Clark says, good evening. Hi, Pam. Glad to have you here. Hi, guys. The last book we get to do that's just one page. So easy. Well, I guess two pages, but it's all open right here. I don't have to turn any pages as I teach. So, Because next week is Zechariah, and Zechariah goes on for a long, long time. So... All of you that have been doing this uh, week by week, I sure hope you have enjoyed the short ones because we are back to the long ones after this. Um, but only two weeks to go. We got Zachariah and we got Malachi. And uh, then we'll be done. So. Just a little bit to go. And it is 7.57 right now. So we'll get started in five, six minutes, somewhere in there. That's, pretty, yeah, that's good enough. As long as I don't lean in too much. Ugh. All right. Haggai. things. I think it should be pretty easy to find. get started here in about five minutes, a little bit less. There we go. A few more people trickling in now. I think this is still legible. Yeah, it's legible-ish. How in the world? It looks like the... I don't know if that's just my computer or... Okay, yeah, it's just my computer. I thought the H had disappeared off of Josiah on the screen, but not here. That was very confusing. Make that a little bit bolder. Josiah. 
here's your uh, 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 here's your bit of trivia for today. So when you have you have names in the Bible that end in a h, especially when they end in i a h, that's a uh, um, that's a shortened version of God's name or the name given to to Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, so instead of saying the whole name, which um, um, traditionally is not spoken aloud, uh, at least except on very special occasions, um, they just say the first half of the name, which is Yah. So it's a shortened term. And so always when you see Yah at the end of a name or Yah or just Ah, it's a reference to God. Um, so you, 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 you end up with names that mean something of God or something to God. So anyway, that's why the H is important on the end of Josiah. All right. Hey, I got a couple people here, but we'll get started in about three minutes. We'll really get underway. Actually, uh, I know that we'll be a little bit down tonight. Uh, Pastor Scott was, uh, uh, he had his study on zoom just a little while ago and uh so have a lot of people busy tonight people are out and about doing sort of doing things so but that's okay that's uh that's why we post all of these first on the facebook page and then we post all of them on youtube uh so you can go back and watch these anytime um edit just a little bit to make sure i'm don't have any personal stuff or anything like that. So, all to say is if you ever have to leave early, if you miss a night or something like that, you can always catch up the next day. So, but it's more fun to do it live. I really enjoy doing it live, uh, especially because I can get some questions and some comments from you all, which is always cool. It's 8.01. We'll get started in about two minutes. Two minutes. Two, two, two minutes. Miranda Soto is watching. Hello, Miranda. Good to see you today. Deborah is here. Hi, Deborah. I just wouldn't know what to do if you weren't here. You've been here every week. And I do appreciate that. And we'll get started in just about a minute. Haggai is also great because we have dates. Like, it it says exactly when things are happening. Um, so it's kind of cool. We don't, have, we don't have to guess. We know exactly when everything happened. All right. We'll get started here in about half a minute. All right. It is 8.03. Go like this. This makes it easier to find this part later on so we can edit easily. Good evening. This is week nine of our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, that means after this week we'll have two more books to go and either two or three more sessions. Um, and so, of course, you can be watching this live or you might be watching this uh, later on on YouTube or on our archive on Facebook. Tonight, we are going to read about the prophet Haggai. Um, Haggai is one of the shorter ones, but Haggai is bound up with several other prophets and several other books in the Bible. Um because Haggai is one of the few books that we have and one of the few prophets we have uh, that comes from a really important time in Judaism and a really important time in the history of the covenant people, uh, which was after the Babylonian exile. 
So I've had this timeline here that I've been referring to um, week after week. And this exile is the last thing that's happened. So I've talked a lot about we have all of these empires that are taking over empires that are taking over empires at the time. Um, and that's basically the history of, of the uh, Jewish people. Um, and so after, after the split of the kingdom and the destruction of the northern tribes at the hand of the Assyrians, the next group to come on the scene that was real threatening uh, were the Babylonians. And the Babylonians uh, sort of slowly but surely chipped away and chipped away and chipped away at the southern kingdom um, until eventually they basically decided they had enough. The Babylonians came, they stormed into Jerusalem, they destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed Solomon's palace, they looted everything in sight, they took the king, they they put the king in front of all the people, um, and in front of the king they killed all of the king's sons, and then they blinded the king. And they took the all of the all of the the really um, powerful important people. They took the scribes. They took the really good artisans. They took the the court people. They took some of the priests, and they rounded up all of them. And they took away the culture of Judah. And they took all these people and they shoved them into Babylon, where they would live in exile for a generation. Um, this is a really cruel tactic. Um, when you're when you're an empire, when you're taking over places, when you're taking over kingdoms, you don't want to kill the people. The people are who work the land, make food, make stuff. You don't want to kill the people. But you also don't want the people to get any ideas in their head about rebellion or making trouble or anything like that. So you take you take away all the leaders, and that's what they did. And so while there were still some people left in Judah, still some people left in the ruins and around the ruins of Jerusalem, uh, the, the higher class and the, the more intelligent and the, the more hardworking, you know, the, the, the cream of the crop all got taken over to Babylon. And so this is the time that we call the exile. And a lot of the Bible, a lot of the Old Testament, was formed in exile. Um, a lot of it was codified. They finally, you know, scrolls that had been lying around, they finally said, no, we need to make sure these are all in the same place. We've got to make sure we keep these because they saw that it was important for them to keep their tradition and keep their society alive uh, while, the Bab while they were in exile. Um, they believed that somehow, some way, they would return um, but Judaism was never the same after this. Um, the, the exile ends up being a crucible. It really forms the people. It really creates their religion. And the Jewish people would never all live in the same place again. Um, there would always be some left over in Babylon that even after they were allowed to come back, they had started to make their life there, so they didn't come back. Um, there were some ba uh, Jews that lived in, um, in Egypt. Um, and so always forever, there were Jewish people all around the world. And as bigger and bigger empires, more organized empires would form, um, the next really big one would be the Persians, which we're going to talk about in a second, then the Greeks, then the Romans. It became easier and easier to be a Jew and to live in all corners um, of the world. So never again would all the people be in the same place. Um, the next empire that comes along after the Babylonians are the Persians. And the Persians come and they steamroll the Babylonians. Um, but the Persians have a, have a different kind of philosophy when it comes to kingdom building um, and to empire building. They thought it was a really good idea to keep people on their land and to keep people worshiping their gods and their place. Um, part of it was uh, it kept people from, um, from being unhappy. It also, they thought, well, if there are gods in this land, we don't want to, you know, make the gods angry. And so when the Persians got to Babylon and they found the Jewish people there and they found that the Jewish people really wanted to go home, they let them. Um, the king was a guy named Cyrus or Cyrus. He was um, 
very, very well beloved um, by the uh, uh, Judeans because he let them go home. He said, go home and not only go home, but um, I'm going to I'm going to supply you with a little bit of a government. I'm going to supply you with some stuff to get your society started again. I want you to go home. Um, and after Cyrus, uh, his son uh, continued the the uh, uh, empire building and he was down in Egypt. And then there was some um, uproar uh, back in Persia. Um, and before uh, Cyrus's grandson could, or uh, son could get back to Persia, um, he died. And there were some other people that died. And what ended up happening is this guy named Darius um, ends up on the throne. And Darius was related to Cyrus, but he wasn't Darius's son, or he wasn't Darius's grandson. But he was related to Cyrus somehow. And Darius ruled for a really long time. Uh, so long and so well that he's one of those people that we add the great after his name. So he's Darius the Great. Um, he was really, really just, you know, a, a good emperor. He was good at being an emperor. All right. And so uh, Darius is the king while we read about Haggai. And there are a couple of other books that go along with Haggai. It's really important. Um, if you really want to understand Haggai... Um, well, we got to read Zechariah. We're going to do that next week. Or you're going to do that in between this week and next week. And you better get started because it's a long one. You also re need to read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which kind of go together. These all told are the story of the Jewish people coming back to Jerusalem. And they come back and there are people that have been living there, but they haven't been doing any rebuilding. They're just, you know, looking after their crops living in their little villages. Jerusalem is still just in ruins. All right? So they get back. The temple's in ruins. Jerusalem is in ruins. And it's really disheartening for everybody. Um, but they they start. They, they get to work again. Um, and they do a few things. First of all, they decide that it would be good not just to have a priest, but we better have somebody who's in charge of all these priests. And he gets the name High Priest. Um, and in Haggai's time, that guy is a name, uh, um, that, that one is a guy by the name of Joshua. And so Joshua is the high priest. It's the first time we have a high priest or an official high priest. Uh, second, it would be good to have a, a ruler of some kind, um, at least a governor. Um, and Darius or Cyrus or, or somebody was really smart and they thought, hey, why don't we put someone who's related to the old king as the governor? Not going to be king, but to be the governor. And so there's a, an element of self-rule now in Jerusalem and in Judah. And sure, they're part of an empire, but they have a, well, if not a king, they have a governor who's related to David. Um, but they have a high priest again. Things are looking pretty good. Um so this is a positive time. This is a this is a um, a time of, of a lot of hope and a lot of expectation. And Haggai ends up being a very very positive book because of that. And so we've been reading a lot of negative stuff, um, a lot of books that are hard to get through, a lot of books where some really harsh things are said and we're not sure what to do with them. Haggai is a nice break from that. Haggai is a really hopeful book. Um, so let's let's read Haggai. Um, and see what we get. So, um, Haggai kind of has five oracles. Um, two of them, it's a little bit hard to tell when they split, and then the fifth one is really, really short. Um, so that's why it's only two chapters, even though we kind of got these five oracles. Um, and the entire thing is in prose. We don't have all the, the rich poetry of some of the other prophets that we've been reading. It's all, um, it's all a story. It's all a narrative. And so the other thing, too, is that because all of these books in the Bible were kind of codified and, and finalized not long after this time period, um, Haggai might have been one of the last books in the Bible written. And so Haggai is, is not only last, but 
it probably existed right in this very form just really soon after Haggai preached. And so probably after Haggai gave these oracles to the king, someone said, we should write down what he said and wrote it all down and made sure it was contained. And this all probably happened really, really fast. Um, in fact, it, it, it's often probably thought that, um, so a lot of Haggai has to do with building the temple. And it's probably thought that the book of Haggai was finished before the temple was finished. Um, so let's read. Um, chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, so, okay, so not long after Darius gets here, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, specificity, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Oh, that's new. Thus says the Lord of hosts. We don't spend enough time talking about the different words that we use about God. Um, we've, we've, it, it's not quite as important in the prophets as it is in some of the older, older parts of the Old Testament, um, in Genesis especially, in Exodus. Um, but it's always important, these titles that get appended to God. Um, always in the Bible, when you see the word Lord, when you see it all in uppercase, um, that's a translation of a translation. Um, it would never be that the word is the name of God, and that name is not to be spoken out loud. Um, now, if this one being recorded and we were we were together in the same room in kind of more academic context where we're studying, then it's okay to say it because you're not really uttering it. You're not really using the name. Um but since we're being recorded, I don't I don't want to disrespect any um, any people that are are still sensitive to that to that tradition. Um, but but always when you see Lord all in uppercase, it's in in the Hebrew in the original Bible, you're getting that name that all um, that holy name of God that you know you're not supposed to say. Um, and so since you weren't supposed to say it, uh, the people had a tradition of substituting in the word Adonai, which means Lord. And so that means in us, in our English Bibles, it gets translated as Lord. Um, so that's what it is. It's Lord, or the Lord, Adonai, the name of hosts. And we haven't seen that before. And some of you in your Bibles might actually have Lord Almighty. But we haven't seen that one. And that one... That name is going to be important for the, the concept that Haggai is trying to get across. And so keep that in mind right now, that Lord of Hosts is going to turn out to be really important. Um, thus says the Lord of Hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, It is, or is it a time for, your, for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. So Haggai is, is, is pointing out the situation. All right, now we're back, and everything's supposed to be good again. We're back in, in Jerusalem. We're happy. We're good. But um, why aren't things going well? You, you're, you're planting food, but no one really seems to have enough to eat. We don't harvest very much. Um, and Haggai is saying, listen, it's because you haven't done your due diligence. You're back in Jerusalem, but you haven't rebuilt the place where God lives. And God now is saying, why do you all have houses that you rush back to live in but I don't have a house. You, you, this is this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to build a house. Um, and so verse 8, Go up into the hills and bring wood and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Now note already something that's happening. When the house is built, what will happen to God is that he will be honored. This is a different word. Um, we'll get to that. So, so far, things you have to keep in mind. Lord of hosts and God will be honored in this house. All right? Two things to keep in mind so far. You have looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? 
I, says the Lord of Hosts, because my house lies in ruins, all of you hurry off to your own houses. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land, on the hills, and on the grain, on the new wine, and the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and on all their labor. So there's a general drought. All right. Um, so, again, we want to keep those two things in mind. He's being called Lord of Hosts, and, and that's actually fairly new. And he is being called, uh, or he, he's, um, um, he wants to be honored by the house. Well, see the other thing. Look at look at where he, his his rule is. Um, he he's talking about how he's withdrawing the the rain from the heavens. So rain isn't falling because God isn't being honored. The ground isn't growing because God is not being honored. Um, and so the question also that we have to ask ourselves is: um, sh Should we also do the same? Should we look if, if there's bad weather or a series of bad weather or a series of bad events? Um, is it right for us to say, oh, God must be trying to tell us something? Um, I would say no, mostly because we're not prophets and we don't, we don't get to have that sort of read. But the other thing, too, is that um, everything about the temple in Jerusalem, all of it has to do with the big word atonement. Um, literally means at one meant. It means being brought back into right relationship with God. And there is something to be said about when the people are in right relationship with God, when we as people are in right relationship with another, these things that are happening... Um, the, the, the floods or the droughts, um, the, the lack of food, not having wine, not having oil, these things take on a different meaning. Um, when everyone is in right relationship with each other, even though there's not as much food as there should be, there's probably still enough food to go around. Or if there's not enough food to go around, um, there's enough food to survive. Or we also, we have a, a, a different respect. And so, I, I, sorry, a, a different respect for, um, for our relationship, um, both with God and the world and with one another. And so we sort of know that, well, maybe we don't have enough food to eat, but um, we, we are fed in other ways, both with each other and with God. But the problem is, is that um, in in these times, God's way of manifesting, God's way of being present, um, was was symbolized by the temple. And so, for the people, if the temple's not there, then in a sense, God is not there. Now, what's important here about this phrase, "the Lord of Hosts," um, is is Haggai, by speaking on God's behalf, is reminding the people that God is not just the God of a temple. God's not just the God of a particular piece of real estate in the, the Near East, um, you know, kind of close to the Mediterranean. No, God is actually the God of the whole world. And this is the thing that's happened while they've been in exile, is that they're, they're, they've had to rethink their relationship with this God. And they finally stripped away almost the last of this thought of, well, you know, we have our God and they have their God and our God is sometimes stronger as long as we do the right thing and, and they have their God, but their God isn't good enough. And they're finally realizing we don't want to worship a tribal God. The only God we're interested in worshiping is the God, the one God. And so they finally made this last uh, jump to monotheism, belief in one God. And so that's why nowhere in Haggai do we talk about God living in the temple. Um, God's presence can be in the temple, but God doesn't dwell exclusively in the temple. Instead, the temple causes God to be honored. That's a very different sort of thought. So that's why Lord of Hosts is so important. It, it, it shows that God is not just God of you or this or this tiny place, but hosts, 
armies, places, people. Um, and God isn't going to live in this temple. God's going to be honored by the temple. All right, let's press on. Um, all right, then there's a second oracle. And now, this one's the one that's a little bit awkward because normally the oracles in, in Haggai, they begin with uh, the date. This one ends with the date. And so, so you know, someone made a mistake while they were copying it down or something like that. Uh, but anyway, um, um, in verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, son of, son of, son of, son of, and the high priest, and with all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of the prophet Haggai as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Now, let's talk about the word fear. It's always just a good place to talk about this because we talk a lot about the fear of the Lord. And every once in a while, I'll have someone tell me, you know, the reason that people don't believe in God anymore is people don't have fear of the Lord. All right. Fear in the Old Testament has a lot less to do with being afraid. It has less to do with shaking in your boots or, or peeing your pants or, or being terrified and scared and has much more to do with a deep sense of respect. Um, the, the, what I can most best compare it to is anybody that has ever, from a safe distance, seen some kind of dramatic um, natural event, like if you've witnessed a tornado from far away, um, or lightning even, or maybe uh, if you've gone north and you've seen the northern lights, uh, in the atmosphere, or even if uh, uh, you've looked at pictures of deep places in the galaxy or in the universe where you have much bigger um, um, star clusters and you get a sense of the magnitude of the universe. That's the kind of fear. It's that deep sense of awe and wonder and respect. And it, it, it's close to that sense of, of fear. It's close to that sense of scary, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, and so the people have awe and respect for the Lord again. And it's because they're, they're seeing God being present again. This prophet has come along and said, you know, um, the, the, these bad things are happening or you're experiencing these bad things because you're not, you, you haven't put God in the center of the city. You haven't put God in the center of, of, of your life again. Uh, you haven't built the house. It's time to build the house. And people go, oh my gosh, that's why that's happening. And they feel it and they sense it. So they have the fear of the Lord again. Um, and so verse 13, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month. And so um, it's been three and a half weeks since the last uh, uh, oracle. Um and the people are finally getting stirred up. And so, you know, sometimes the, the, the movement happens, the word happens, the idea happens, but it takes a little while for people to get on board. And that's kind of what's happened here. Um, but finally, things are getting stirred up. And like, yes, we, we are going to rebuild this temple. Uh, we, we need to put God back. All right. Um, chapter two, actually the very end of, of chapter one and into chapter two, it is one month later. And just like last week when we talked about Zephaniah, uh, we are back at the Feast of Booths, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles, or Sukkoth. All the people are in Jerusalem, according to tradition. Maybe this is like the first time it's happened since they've been back, and so all the people are back in Jerusalem for the first time for, for uh, the Feast of Booths. And all the people are there. It's a month after, so they've just started building the temple. A couple of the stones have gone up. Um, you know, they've cleared away some of the rubble. They're, they're just getting started. Um, and they have a time to remember, as they do at the Feast of Booths, God's power, God's presence in their life, their, their deliverance, their freedom. And Haggai speaks up again. And he says in the second year of the king, da-da-da-da-da, um, verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? 
Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, because I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. And that promise and that memory, that's the whole reason they've gathered together for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so God says, hey, remember when I delivered you back then? and walked with you through uh, uh, th through the sea, and there was a, a, a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud, and or sorry, fire by night, cloud by day. I'm still here. I'm still doing the same thing. Um, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. This would be, th th this is a great passage for Methodists, all right? Um, for, for Methodists, it's always, we always believe in um, what, what some people have called responsible grace, or what I like to call respondable grace, is that um, sometimes God acts and we move, and then sometimes we move and God responds to us. And so, um, you know, on Sunday morning, we, we take communion, okay? Um, and we say, God, will you be with us here now and, and on these, uh, uh, you know, pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine, all right? We ask, and we believe that God responds. But then also, um, you know, we're the ones that have to lift the juice to our mouths or, or lift the bread to our mouths and eat. Um, but then God responds. But then also sometimes without us doing anything. God just pulls us into a relationship or pulls us back into church or pushes us to go and do something. And what, what a wonderful image is being drawn here in chapter two of the people starting to work, but they just, they feel like it's worthless what they're doing. You know, God, remember how big it used to be? Remember how wonderful it used to be? And, and Haggai comes along and he says, listen, you don't need to worry about how big it used to be because God is moving. You know, you all are, are putting up these stones and you're getting to work and God is moving. And you know what? All the world is God's anyway. And so if it's meant to be, God is going to bring in the silver and bring in the gold and he's going to make this temple beautiful. Um, and, and God is just happy and honored that you're working. All right. We get one rebuke in Haggai, and that comes in the next one. So two months after that, um, two months after the feast, they've been working on this temple now for like three months, something like that. Um, and in verse 10, it says, Okay, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now this is interesting. Ask the priests for a ruling. If one carries consecrated meat and the fold of one's garment, and with the fold touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And the priests answered, no. And then Haggai said, if one who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priests answered, yes, it becomes unclean. Um, ritual cleanliness was a very important part of temple life. Um, you could only take part in certain festivals and rituals if you were considered ritually clean. Now, this doesn't have to do with literally being dirty or having germs on your hands or anything like that. Um, but things that had to do with death were often considered unclean. Um, death and blood. And so if you had ritual uncleanliness, um, you, you could also sort of contaminate other things. And you had to be uh, restored via, you know, you had to wash yourself in certain ways, or you have to stay away from the community for certain times. And some of the things probably had to do with, you know, actual cleanliness. They figured out that if people are around dead bodies too long, they get sick, or if they're... Uh, uh, they're working with muck or grime of some kind um, and you know they figure out okay they're sick and they don't want sickness or death to be in God's temple among God's people um, it's a little bit strange to us I'll perfectly admit and I 
myself, I don't completely understand it sort of theologically. Why, why is it this way? Um, I, I will say, though, that there is something important about tradition. Um, so, for instance, for us, again, as Methodists, I'm going to use communion again. Um, after communion is done, we don't throw away the bread. We don't step on it. We don't do it. We, we don't do anything like that. It doesn't get thrown away. We either return it to nature or we eat it. Um, and sometimes that means that the pastor gets an extra hunk of Hawaiian bread and he takes it home and he munches on it all day. But it gets eaten um, because that's what it's what it's meant for. So that's because, you know, we believe that the real presence of Christ is is met um, in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the cup. And so even though we don't believe, um, for instance, we don't believe as the Catholics do that there's a real transformation of the bread or that God is, is um, extra concentrated presence somehow in the bread, but it still has value. And just because communion is done doesn't mean that something that has been used to uh, communicate or transfer or give the presence of Christ to somebody just because the ceremony is over doesn't mean that that should just be thrown away. And so there is an importance to keeping tradition, sometimes even just for tradition's sake, just for ritual sake. And that has something to do with cleanliness here. Now, what um, Haggai is really pointing out here is he's saying, listen, when you touch something that's unclean and you touch other things, they become unclean too. The same thing doesn't work for holiness. Um... And so the problem here in, in Haggai is that the people have probably been using the altar at the temple. They've gotten the altar back, and they've been trying to do the rituals, the sacrifices, and the stuff like that. But you can't do that until you've done all the things you need to do to make yourselves and others clean, and you can't do that until the temple is done. And so, so Haggai is saying... Um, it's the same thing with this unclean, you know, touching the, the body as it is with the people. You all aren't clean yet. Um, and, you know, we could sit here and say, no, come on, you know, it's not their fault. The, the temple was destroyed. They don't have a place. But just because a wrong was done in the past a long time ago doesn't mean that the wrong doesn't need to be rectified. Um Things that happen in the past have continuing action or continuing effects to the present. Um, and so I, we're doing this in my hometown right now. Um, I'm from Tulsa, um, and in the very early 1900s, Tulsa was um, host to one of the worst incidents of um, racial violence. They call it the Tulsa Race Riot. It's better to call it the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, and hundreds of people were destroyed, killed, and their lives were just absolutely ruined. And it's only recently that um, people have begun to talk about it again, to acknowledge it, to acknowledge that, um, you know, a lot of the poverty on the north side of the city is a continuation of that event. And you have that people say, oh, why are we talking about this now? This happened a long time ago. It doesn't have anything to do with us. Well, here's a good point. Haggai makes a great point here. You know, just because something happened a long time ago um, doesn't mean that there's not cleanliness that has to be made today. Um, and so so in verse 14, Haggai says, um, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, says the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. But now consider what will come to pass from this day on. Before a stone was placed upon a stone in the Lord's temple, how did you fare? When one came to heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When you came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and mildew and hail, yet you did not return to me. Consider from this day on, on the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day of the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, is there any seed left in the barn? Do the vine, the fig tree, and the pomegranate, the olive tree still yield nothing? From this day on, I will bless you. The blessing is not in the completion of the work, but that you started the work. You put the first effort forward. You put the first, you, you took the first step, and God responds. Um, 
so much here we've gone back to even though this this whole book is couched in the language of the temple and of ritual and of ritual cleanliness and and of getting the high priest and building the temple and all that still we have here a vision of the religion of the heart in that it's in the doing that you're blessed um, it's important that the temple be rebuilt, not just because it's going to, you know, allow you to make the ritual sacrifices and all that, but so that God is honored, so that you remember God and that God is in your midst. Um, later that day, Haggai has a special message for the, the, the governor, for Zerubbabel. Uh, verse 20, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and overthrow the throne of the kingdom. Now, one thing we need to point out here. Um, grammar. we got to talk about grammar. Um, grammar in Hebrew is, is a little bit different than grammar in English. In English, we have really defined past tense, present tense, future tense. Um little bit squishier in Hebrew and what I have translated here in my New Revised Standard Version as being past tense is probably better set in the sense of yes past tense but it's addressing something that I do so if I told you right now I eat pizza um, that there there's not only am I saying that I have eaten pizza in the past but I'm also saying I'm probably going to eat pizza in the future. And so that's what's also happening here. So what's translated in the past tense here, it says, I, uh, or in the future tense rather, is I'm about to shake the heavens of the earth and to overthrow the kingdom. I am about to destroy. It's really simple. He just, God is saying, I shake the heavens of the earth. That's what I do. I overthrow the thrones of kingdoms. That's what I do. I am about to destroy. No, not I'm about to. I destroy the strength of kingdoms and the nations. I overthrow the chariots. And so this is really a statement of God's power. And so in verse 23, after making the statement of power, on that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. And it's a nice ending here in that even though Zerubbabel is not the king, he's still descended from David. And he's still somehow chosen by God. And so this is God's last act in Haggai is I'm going to bless the work of you all as you build this temple. I'm going to bless your work um, as you as you make the efforts to to get back to cleanliness and um, I'm going to bless you by by kind of restoring my relationship with David. Now, it's a little bit tricky because we don't know what happened to Zerubbabel, and by the time of Jesus, some um, you know, 400, 500 years later, we uh, we don't know what happened to to Zerubbabel, why he's not ruling anymore, why he's not the governor anymore. Um, but there's there's still a promise here, and it's it's. It's God's remark that um, just because it's the people building the temple and this governor that's doing the, the movement and the, the ruling um, and the high priest that's making these things, really ultimately the one who is at work here is God. Um, and God is working through people. And yes, the God that is the God of all the heavens and the earth, the Lord of hosts, is still also the God that is intimately concerned with individuals and works through individuals. Um, so that is the book of Haggai. I think that's all that um, I have to say about it. Um, Want to hear if you all have any uh, questions or thoughts. Um, seen a few more people trickle in after I got started. So if anyone has any questions or if there's anything I can explain or you just have something on your mind whatever it might be um would love to love to have you all comment um uh, over in the comment section um i'm gonna stand up for a second stretch my legs uh, get a glass of water and i'll be back in two three minutes something like that
right. Say some hellos or some hellos. Yeah. We talk for 40 minutes straight into a camera and suddenly after that you can't talk anymore. Uh, all right. Marty here. Marty is so good to be here every week. Marty's good to see you. Wayne A. Walter says here. That is Wayne and or Sean. Um, John Parrish says, hi, Ben, and hi, everybody. John, always good to hear from you. Also, we got a hello from Judy Thomas, who says she's listening. All right. Gwen Pasby says, so interesting. God is always trying to teach us how he is number one in all circumstances. I yeah I really like um, I really like the message of Haggai. It, it it was it's such a wonderful break from a lot of the doom and gloom of some of the other prophets, um, where there is hope but it's always hope that you're kind of plucking out um, of a of a hard place. But yeah I, that's what Haggai is really all about is that the the people are going back and they're living in their homes and they're doing their things, but they've sort of forgotten like well, the whole reason that we were going to go back is so that we could have a temple and we could we could worship god again and so they, they haven't had the chance they, or they, they just hadn't done it um and haggai says listen your your society is going to fall apart again you're not going to to have enough food or water or anything like that if if you don't make your atonement again um and atonement and God's presence and everything was sort of enacted and symbolized by this temple in their midst. So it's time to build the temple again. Um, temple lasted a long time too. Um, the temple that they built here and was expanded several times um, lasted all the way up until Jesus's time um, and, and was torn down a little bit after that by uh, one of the Roman emperors. Um, so the temple lasted a really, really good uh, long while. Um, so I'll keep talking for just a second here if anyone else had any other uh, comments or anything. Um, we are we are going to do Zechariah next week, and we might stretch that into two weeks. Uh, uh, Zechariah is much longer and is um, much more in-depth. Um, and there's, there's a lot of visions, and there's a lot of weird symbolism. Um, Zechariah... It's worth, worth taking our time on. Um, and this was going to be a 12-week study, and we only have two left, and it's week nine, and so we, we might stretch it out for um, an extra two. So we'll probably do Zechariah in two parts. Um, and so if I if I show up next week and, you know, I only get through half of it, that's, uh, don't, don't say I didn't warn you. Um, and so we'll probably, um, I might, I might send out a message on Facebook or, or in other places just saying, hey, here's how we're going to divide it up. So if you don't want to read the whole thing in one go, um, but I'd encourage you to read the whole thing in one go. And remember that um, Zechariah is working and speaking um, near around the same time as Haggai. And so this is in that post-exilic period. They're back in Jerusalem. Things are, are starting to look up. Zechariah has some interesting things to say. Um, it's one of the more difficult books of the Bible, so um, we'll need to we'll need to approach it carefully. So probably two weeks on Zechariah, unless I can come up with some brilliant way to do it in one week, but I don't think I will because I'm not that smart. And then we'll do Malachi the week after that. Um, but hey, we uh, we've been doing this for nine weeks. Um, it was super ambitious to do a 12-week study all online, but you all have been here week after week. Um, it's just been so great. Um, so been really blessed and, and fortunate to be doing this with you all. And, uh, like I said last week, um, thinking probably, uh, might take a few weeks off, but then probably get back going again, um, uh, with, uh, with an online study. I think this is, this is really, um, really a good way to do this. So, all right. Well, good to see all you all. Hope you all have a wonderful night. Uh, grace and peace to you all, and we will see you next week.